You there's still at the door. Oh, sure. Still there. Okay. All right. Oh, yes. Okay. You can just leave it there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oh. Um, all right. Hello. Um, so um, thank you to those of you who, who showed up for this. I know it's not uh, necessarily convenient time. Um, and sorry about also the background noise here. Um, so before I start, I wanted to say one thing about the reading for next time, uh, the, which the, the reading from Thomas Aquinas about angels. Um, it's, um, I guess, well, I hope it will become clear based on what I say today already why it might be relevant, but I think it's, uh, I mean, uh, Leibniz uh, in some ways based his metaphysics on, on Thomas's angelology. <laughs> so uh, um, it's a good example of something I think I've mentioned before that something you think of as a weird, like a weird medieval role uh, you know, irrelevant medieval subjects can turn out to be really important for four areas of modern philosophy, just because, uh, um, um, it doesn't necessarily stay where it was. <laughs> so, um, um, okay, and so are, unless there are questions about something, I'll start talking about the monodology. Right, so um, so the main part of the reading for this time is was the beginning of the monodology. Um, as I mentioned last time, this is not something that was published in Leibniz's lifetime, um, uh, that it was written late in his life around 1714. And it contains kind of a, it's, I think it's very popular in teaching Leibniz um, and because it contains kind of a brief summary of his whole metaphysical system. Um, and I mean, I also assigned the end of the uh, new system of nature that it, more just for like background or a second description of some of the things that are going on in the monodology. Um, but I feel like the monodology uh, formulation is clearer. So I'm mostly gonna talk about that. Okay, so first of all, um, what is it? The monodology is about monads. <laughs> um, what is a monad? Um, so I guess like the first, so I mean, well, what should I say? This word means unit, right? It's the Greek equivalent of unit. Um, Um, it's, I think it was even included in one of the Aristotle readings where <clears throat> Aristotle defines it as a, um, um, basically a, a dimensionless quantity that doesn't have position, right? As opposed to a point, which is a dimensionless quantity, the quantity that does have position. So, I mean, Aristotle's, you know, I guess thinking about arithmetic when he says that, but uh, Leibniz, um, um, I don't know, adapts it for his own purposes. So it's, I mean, usually, uh, 
Well, I guess you could say it's all line that's already decided to leave it untranslated. That is to leave the Greek word untranslated. <laughs> so we're just following on by just calling just calling it monad. So what is a monad? Um, I think. Um, Um, so, um, A monad is something simple, and it's a simple substance. A monad is a simple substance. So this is really important not to get confused about. A monad is these are two ways of describing the same thing. Um, And uh, therefore, everything either is a monad or is. Wait, what just happened? Oh, did the wrong thing. Everything either is a monad or it's made out of monads. Right? That's what he said in section two. Since composites are, um, you know, are nothing unless they're made out of something simple, everything that's not a simple substance must be made out of simple substances. That is monads. Um. Now, uh, um, therefore, you can also call monads elements. Now, uh, simple substance in Aristotelianism used to mean the four elements, right? Like the simple substances were earth, uh, air, fire, and water. And everything was made out of them in the sense that the way you got other substances were by mixing the elements in different proportions. Um, so at least that's the way you get other homogeneous substances. Um, of course, to get non-homogeneous substances, you have to put together homogeneous substances. Right, like so to get a horse or a human being, it, it, we have we have lots of different parts, the you know, like blood and whatever, right, that are that are individually homogeneous, and each one of them contains a certain mixture of the elements. So, uh, like in in a sense, all of that is still true with Leibniz's elements, but they're completely different from those elements. Right, there's. First of all, there aren't four of them. There are infinitely many. <laughs> and the way things are made out of them is not because by mixing them together or something like that. The way things are, so it's not that. What is it? 
So like you could start by thinking of it as, um, you know, the, what Leibniz says about them in section three is that a monad is an atom, right? So you might think the way everything else is made out of monads is you kind of stick monads together to get something bigger. But this is wrong. <laughs> Um, because things like this, this is what, um, so things that can be stuck together this way, um, but that are themselves simple. There's two alternatives, basically. One is they could be mathematical points. That is, they could be simple and so simple means it doesn't have parts, right? So they could be simple because um, you uh, because they have zero size. And then if you put them together, well, you still get something with zero size, right? Because zero plus zero is zero. This is, you know, what Leibniz sometimes refers to as the labyrinth of the composition of the continuum. You can't, it seems that you can't make a continuous quantity by adding together mathematical points because you'll never get beyond zero. Now, like, um, have we discovered that that's not true and that you can get a continuous quantity by adding together points of zero extension? Um, as long as you have a big enough infinity of them, well, uh, we've sort of adjusted the axioms of set theory to make that true. <laughs> I think it would be more accurate. Um, but be that as it may, like uh, Leibniz and um, and other people in this time, like uh, all agree there's no way you would ever get a uh, non-zero quantity by adding together mathematical points. So what else could these things that are stuck together that are simple be? Well, they could be um, physical atoms, physical points, right? So this is another alternative that Leibniz uh, discusses. And he's, but he says, um, that's really impossible. So a physical point would be something, a, a physical atom would be a body that's so small that it can't be divided into parts, but not of zero extension. And Leibniz says, that makes no sense. If it's not of zero extension, it can be divided into parts that are smaller than it. I mean, uh, it might be maybe it's somehow impossible to actually make the division, but the division can be made in thought at least, right? It does have parts. Um, and therefore it doesn't get us out of the original problem, right? Like you can keep taking smaller and smaller parts of it and ask, what are they made out of? And you just keep getting smaller and smaller and you never get to one that's simple. And if you start again with one that has zero size, then you never get back to any, no matter, any part, no matter how small, no matter how many you add together. So like not, no way of putting together simples that's like that is going to work. How does it actually work? I think I'm not in a position to try to explain that yet. <laughs> um, but um, but the thing to understand, therefore, is that monads, as I said, uh, um, Aristotle defines a monad as, I, I guess I said zero extension or something like that, but that's not what he says. He says that's indivisible. Right? Like, I, I guess maybe I said zero dimensional. Yeah, I mean, that's correct. But what Aristotle actually says there, you know, when he defines what we would call zero, one, two, and three dimensional quantities, he says, you know, a point is something that's not divisible at all. A line is divisible in one way, um, you know, but uh, 
surface is divisible in two ways. Right, so a monad is something that's indivisible but and doesn't have position. So monads are not uh, bodies. They're not in space. Um, uh, well, later we're going to, but after last lecture, you should realize how this thing is, how things like this are going to happen in Leibniz. Later, we're going to talk about where more monads are in space. <laughs> but when you just think about what the monad actually is in all metaphysical strictness, it doesn't have a position. So they can't be put together like this. They're, what are they? Well, they're, they're a kind of incorporeal uh, substance. Um, they're, therefore, they're, they're like, um, they're incorporeal substances. They're like what Aristotle would call immaterial substances. Now, um, depending on what you mean by matter, that this will be right for uh, Leibniz or Long, right? But it's immaterial substance is a substance that, that's not a composite of form and matter. And again, depending on what you mean by matter, this this will be strictly speaking right or wrong according to Leibniz. But this is definitely true. They're not bodies. A body has to exist between certain limits in space. That's what makes it the kind of body it is. But that's what makes it the body it is, right? And remember that that led to an infinite regress, which... Descartes doesn't know what to do, do about basically, and Spinoza swallows and says, "Yes, it's an infinite rewrite." Yes, Aiden, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, I was wondering if you could explain again how uh, Leibniz arrived at like monads being um, not having a position in space. I kind of got a little lost there. Well, I mean. Uh... Or are we going to discuss that later down the line? Well, we we are going to discuss that later down the line. But I think I did say something about it already. So I mean, but maybe I didn't say it as clearly as I could have. That so the the, the monadology opens by saying that there must be simple things because there couldn't be composite things unless they were simple things. And um, um, and. So at least at this stage, we're, I mean, at every stage, sort of, but at least at this stage, we're thinking of composite things as bodies, right? So it's natural to think of the simple things they're made out of as simple bodies that are stuck together. But I, but I just said that Leibniz um, um, thinks there's two alternative ways of understanding that and, and that neither of them would work. So the simples of which composite things, that we, the composite things that we call bodies have to be composed of simples, but the simples they're composed of can't themselves be bodies. And they can't be spatial at all, right? That is, they can't be simple, parts of body and they can't be simple parts of space that is mathematical points, right? Because neither of those things, because, or sorry, because mathematical points, there's no way of composing to get um, a, a composite body and physical points um, are not really possible. Right, that is, um, what we're thinking of here, when we think of physical atoms, we're not thinking of something that's really simple. So it doesn't solve a problem. So uh, does, does that make it clear why? I mean, it, what, what I haven't said anything about is, is like, what's the alternative? How could a body be made out of immaterial, incorporeal things? I haven't explained that yet. <laughs> 
but I just explained why um, we're get, why Leibniz thinks we have to go in that direction, right? So, so uh, uh, a monad is incorporeal; it's not a body; it doesn't have a position, um, and what it is is kind of like a mind or soul. So, uh, because um, it doesn't have position, extension, uh, divisibility, like the things that bodies have, but it does have something like intellect and will, or at least perception and appetition. Right? So it's more like a mind than it is like a body. And some of the monads are minds. But others are like something more rudimentary that's like a mind. Um, so like um, um so this this kind of incorporeal, uh, in some sense, intellectual substance is very much like what an Aristotelian would call an angel. So again, like that's the connection to Thomas's angelology, um, and it's you know, and it's it needs Thomas's angelology because um, Thomas's uh, predecessors in the Aristotelian tradition um, didn't have a, a good way of under... They thought of angels as um, eternal, unchanging, for unmoved movers of the, plant, of the celestial spheres. Um, so they're, they're, they're not enough like our minds to serve the purpose that Leibniz wants here. But, um, those have been said uh, a long time ago. It's kind of like Plotinus is one, but several of them. Kind of. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> um, it's also kind of like Spinoza's substance, but there's several of them. All right, but um, um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll say more like what um, I think the, the more detailed analogy to something platonic is in this system. So, right. So, I mean, of course, these things aren't exactly like angels, right? Like the angels, according to Thomas, they all have they all have very perfect intellects and wills. They're, so there aren't like rudimentary angels. <laughs> um, but still, like if you if if you look at everything in the history of Aristotelian thought about the different kind of substances. There could be, I think, Thomistic angels are the are are pretty close to what Leibniz is talking about. So you know, so so therefore, like you can think of of Leibniz as having said, everything is made out of infinitely many angels. <laughs> that's the, <laughs> that's the way this system is going to work. Um, Um, so there's kind of two like there's kind of two directions to go from here from having set like laid out the the basic situation here. One is um the same more about how the system is supposed to work. The other is to try to explain why someone would say this weird thing. <laughs> like what, what, what makes Linus think this? And um, I think 
this time I'm going to be talking more about the first of those things, right? Like just trying to explain how logic as a system works. I mean, I'm going to make, well, I'll make some remarks right away about some of the problems he's trying to solve here. Um, he's trying to solve the, the Cartesian mind-body problem. Um, he's trying to solve, as I already mentioned, the problem of how continuous quantity can be made up of symbols. Um, he's, uh, um, and, and in doing that, he's trying to solve these other problems about extension as Descartes understands it, or body as Descartes understands it, right? Like, what is it that's extended here? Um, what's the difference between what's extended here and what's extended there? Um, and uh, he's trying to solve these problems while avoiding the bad conclusions that Spinoza reaches. <laughs> um, that is, uh, number one, however you want to describe it, the lack of distinction between God and the world, right? And you can call that atheism or acosmism or pantheism or, but one way or the other, that's something that Leibniz is trying to avoid. Um, also, he's um, trying to avoid Spinoza's conclusion that we are unfree. Um, um, not, although, as we'll see, not by denying determinism. Um, but, you know, as you may realize already from what Descartes says about this, the issue about freedom um, the real issue for the, for freedom about all of these people is not really tied up with determinism per se, right? Remember, Descartes says that I'm freest when reason compels me to judge in a certain way. Right? This kind of freedom of indifference that, can, that, that Descartes also thinks we have, he says, is like a lower form of freedom, you know? Because after all, that's not really what you want, right? Like when you say you want to be free, you don't want to be able to decide randomly. <laughs> you want to be able to decide what to do because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> um, so um, and Spinoza denies that we can do that. Right, like that's the <laughs> dispute between Descartes and so that's the important dispute between Descartes and Spinoza here. So Leibniz is going to try to explain why um, um, uh, we really are free in um, or can be free in that uh, Cartesian sense, at least sometimes. So those are all reasons. And then there's a further reason that we saw um, uh, last time is a reason for him um, that counts as a reason for him trying to find some truth in all kinds of things. Plotinus, uh, Thomas Aquinas, Descartes, and Spinoza, right? He wants to explain what's true of, in all of these views. So like, I kind of like you throw all those things together and get the system. <laughs> um, or you get at least the motivation for the system. Okay, so like I said, uh, right now I'm going to try to go on and discuss more of the details of how the system works, but are there questions before? Yeah. Okay, um, Okay. so more characteristics of monads. I've written this in a weird way, but I guess I want to leave these ones down here. <laughs> but 
Um, okay, so like, first of all, so a monad is, or maybe I should just write these again up here. Why am I not using my eraser? Incorporeal, kind of immaterial, and kind of like a mind or soul. What else? Well, it's indivisible. Um, that follows from the part the fact that it has no parts. Um, so it's indivisible means it's a kind of atom. Right? Literally speaking, atom means indivisible. Right? This this part is the in and this part is the divisible. Right? So it's a kind of atom. Um, um, Leibniz calls it a formal atom. What does that mean? Well, I think this is already a clue to how monads are going to turn out to be related to what we think of as bodies. A, a formal atom means um, something you can't divide into things with the same form. So actually, like according to Aristotelians, every animal is a formal atom. I don't know that any Aristotelians use exactly that terminology, although they do. So like the, the Greek word atomos, which is translated or just transliterated as atom, is also sometimes translated as individual, right? Like they do use that to mean individuals within a species. Um, I'm not sure if, if the, the, the exact phrase formal atom is is used for this, but like, so Bucephalus, of course, Bucephalus is divisible, right? Like you can cut Bucephalus in half, but Bucephalus is not divisible into horses, right? There's no way to cut Bucephalus uh, into pieces so that you end up with two horses. Um, with plants already, this is less clear. Okay? I mean, it seems like you can kind of cut a plant into two pieces, both of which are plants. Maybe even Aristotle discusses these cases, like sim some kind of simple animals can be cut in half and the, like little worms and both sides <laughs> continue to be worms. But, uh, but at least most animals are formal atoms like this. Um, so that, you know, that explains something about what it means that the, that the monad um, doesn't have parts and isn't divisible. Um, I mean, it's, I guess, or I guess I would say it's what you would expect from a mind or soul, or again, this word that um, Leibniz selects as being a little bit more neutral and teleki, right? It's what you would expect from something like this that you, um, um, That you can't take it apart into two of the two more into two of those things, right? It's like the you can't divide the form of Bucephalus into two forms of horse, right? Notice that I mean, if if we just think of a substance whose only attribute is um, or only differentia is extension. That is a Cartesian body, then it's not a formal atom, 
right? Like this thing is a body. That's its specific form. But when you divide it into two pieces, the two pieces are also bodies. Um, so like, um, that's a way of seeing, I think, well, first of all, it's a way of seeing like what leads Leibniz's thought in this direction. He's thinking the problem with bodies is there can't be anything simple in them because when you divide them into parts, you just get more bodies and they can just be divided into more bodies and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, and and that's all Descartes had left and he ended up with all these problems. So that's what leads him to think Maybe we need those bad old substantial forms, right? Those bad old substantial forms, like um, at least uh, gave us something that in a way was simple, that in a way was indivisible. Right, okay, so that's one thing, they're indivisible. Um, there, um, they can't naturally begin or end. That is, they're not, they're, they're ingenerable and incorruptible. Now, see, I, I mean, you have to emphasize naturally. So, like, um, it's going to be important to lie that uh, God can bring a monad into existence out of nothing. That's called creation, right? And God can make, uh, can, like, uh, reduce a monad back to nothing. That's called <laughs> annihilation. Um, so, like, nothing about the monad proves that that can't happen. But um, what can't happen is um, that by a natural process, the monad comes into being. The way we think Bucephalus, the way an Aristotelian thinks Bucephalus comes into being in his mother's womb, or a mouse comes into being in a pile of rags left in the sun, right? Um, and uh, um, and similarly, uh, uh, the monad can't naturally pass out of being the way uh, Aristotelians think Bucephalus does when he dies. Um, And like Leibniz says, it's because they don't have parts that this can't happen. In other words, the, the Leibniz is saying that that when we think of when we think of a substance as coming into existence, not out of nothing, but naturally out of previously existing substances. Um, what we're really thinking of is is the parts coming together to make a composite. I, I don't know what I'm drawing here, but right, we're really thinking, you know, here's the time direction. There were a bunch of parts here, and now they stuck to each other or they got mixed with each other. And that's how we get the composite substance. So this is something that can naturally happen. These parts, like, um, can come on to each other or get mixed up with each other. And similarly, once you have it, the parts can come apart again. And then the composite is no longer there. So a composite, Live is saying, we can understand how it can naturally come into being and naturally pass out of being. But if it has no parts, there's no way for it to do that. Um, uh,
Kant actually raises an objection to this argument. He says, like, how do we know it couldn't go out of existence by kind of gradually uh, uh, decreasing in degree <laughs> until there was nothing there, right? Like an intensive quantity. Um, not sure if Leibniz would have an answer to that or not. But in any case, this, this is Leibniz's argument for why, since they don't have parts, they can't naturally begin or end. Um, right? So that's what he says in sections four through six. This is this he says already in section three. This he says in sections four through six. And um, a monad is not acted on by any external cause. That's section seven. It's not acted on by any external cause. Again, I think um, you're you're supposed to be able to uh, to to see that from the the fact that it has no parts. Um, uh, what he actually says. Um, There is also no way of explaining how a monad can be altered or changed internally by some other creature. I guess I should have said is not acted by an external cause except God, right? That's why he says by some other creature, creature in the literal sense of a created thing, right? So there is also no way of explaining how a monad can be altered or changed internally by some other creature, since one cannot transpose anything in it, nor can we con can one conceive of any internal motion that can be excited, directed, I think it's because this book is so big augmented or diminished within it, as can be done in composites. So uh, that it would take some work to make that into a rigorous argument uh, or, or a detailed argument anyway. Um, I guess I, sh I should have said maybe about the monodology in general, it's a summary of the points of, of Leibniz's system. It doesn't contain it contains like very short arguments for things, but not like long drawn out proof. Um, to some extent, you can find more extensive arguments in the theodicy, but in the theodicy, it's less clear, much less clear about what his system actually is, which is one reason he wrote this explanation. Um, to some extent, you can find more detailed arguments in some of those papers like new system of nature or specimen of dynamics, but to a large extent, you have to reconstruct what the argument was. <laughs> um, so um, so anyway, uh, it's like there's supposed to be a proof that the um, by any other finite cause, Well, um, so if you put these three things together, um, this is what Spinoza says about substances, right? In fact, these are basically like, um, some of the things that Spinoza proves at the beginning of book one in the ethics. 
about substances. The only difference is we don't get the surprise, oh, there's only one substance, <laughs> right? On the contrary, there's infinitely many substances, but they're all like more like Spinoza's substance than they are like one of Descartes' substances. Um, I mean, uh, Descartes does think this, these two things about minds as opposed to bodies, but not this. Um, and um, um, more than that, uh, every monad, uh, a monad is not very much like, so if I, we're trying to understand the transition from Spinoza to Leibniz, and we say, well, there's, you know, uh, there's infinitely, according to Leibniz, there's infinitely many substances. According to Spinoza, there's just one substance, but there's infinitely many modes, right? So you might think, let's compare Leibniz's substances to Spinoza's modes, right? So like, they're supposed to be like minds. Let's combine them, we compare them to the modes of the attribute of thought. But I think actually that's probably the wrong place to start. What they're more like is Spinoza's attributes. Remember, there's one substance, but there's infinitely many attributes according to Spinoza. And each attribute expresses the um, entire divine essence. Um, well, it turns out that that's what a monad also does. It expresses the divine essence and the whole universe. So, um, section did he actually say that one? We already saw that even in the discourse on metaphysics. Right? No. I guess when I, when I get to it later, I'll read it to you from inside. But um, right, so Leibniz says that every one of these monads. Um, um, is a different way of expressing uh, um, God's, uh, well, God's essence and God's act in causing the world. I mean, this part is just like Spinoza. This part is kind of like Spinoza's attribute of thought. Right. 
right? That is the um the um each monad expresses all the other monads. Um, so, uh, so, so, so what? So is Leibniz just the same as Spinoza, only he's calling the attributes monads? No, I mean, there's a fundamental difference here. And I think the, the, the fundamental, like, difference that Leibniz um, that divides Leibniz from Spinoza, that he then gets all the other things he wants out of, is the distinction between possible and actual. So, right, like remember, Spinoza said that everything possible exists. Um, so every possible attribute exists, for example. According to Leibniz, not every possible monad exists. So there's infinitely many ways of expressing um, the divine essence. Some of them are actual and express what God actually did, and others of them are merely possible. And if they existed, they would express God doing something else. Um, and that's, that's why I had to list these two things here. Um, when I say everything else comes from that, um, Well, maybe I need to say more about the details of the system before I explain, but I'll just say that like what makes it possible to have lots of different attributes of thought, for example, uh, so to speak, right? That every monad is a is a is kind of like the attribute of thought, and none of them are like the attribute of extension. Like what what makes that possible? Um, and gets rid of that weird asymmetry that we saw in Spinoza, where the attribute of thought seemed to not be like the other attributes. Um, what makes that possible is um, that uh, there's something besides just uh, um, everything possible in every possible way for a monad to keep track of. Namely, uh, which other monads were created. <laughs> so that's like, that's both what makes these monads, although they express the divine essence different from God and also what may, allows them to be different from each other. So I'm going to go on to describe the like the internal structure of monads more uh, in, in more detail in a way that hopefully will explain what I just said. But other questions before I go on? I don't feel like I'm being super clear about this. So if there were questions, that would be good. I guess not. All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to erase all of this. And then we have to keep it all in mind, trying to understand what these things are. And I'm going to talk about the internal structure of a monad.
So, of course, by internal structure, I don't mean the structure of its parts because it doesn't have parts. <laughs> um, but um, it has things that are in it not as a part, right? That is, it has something that are like accidents or modes. So that's why it has an internal structure. And how does that work? Well, so basically there's, um, um, three stages to this structure. First of all, every molet moda has what Leibniz calls a quality. This is section eight and nine where he talks about it. Um, so, uh, here he's not using quality in the sense of the category of quality from Aristotle, right? But he is using quality in the sense where Aristotle says the differentia of a substance is a quality. Which, um, remember, was understood by Avicenna and others following Avicenna as a, as a different use of the word quality, basically, right? That the word quality is equivocal. It, it refers to this accident, to this category of accidents, but it also refers to the kind of essential characteristic that make a substance the kind of substance that it is. Um, so according to Leibniz, um, every substance must have a quality that, that is every monad must have a quality that makes it the kind of monad that it is. And no two of them can have the same quality. Right, so that every monad must have a quality that makes it what it is. Um, that is, that, that there must be differentia, or there must be differentiae that, that separate monads into different species. So they can't be just like Cartesian extended substances that are differentiated from each other only by the modes of extension. They have to have some kind of, each one has to have a special characteristic, special in the sense of determining its species, right? Each one of them has to have a special characteristic that makes it the kind of monad that it is. And here again, he justifies that in terms of avoiding the problems that Descartes is going to have explaining how composite substances work. Right? If simple substances did not differ at all in their qualities, there would be no way of perceiving any change in things. Since what there is in a composite can only come from its simple ingredients, and if monads had no qualities, they would be indiscernible from one another, since they also do not differ in quantity. Right, because they don't have quantity, or their quantity is one. As a result, assuming a plenum, right, a plenum is the opposite of a vacuum. A plenum means space is full. As a result, assuming a plenum in motion, each place would always receive only the equivalent of what it already had, and one state of things would be indistinguishable from another. Right, so that's just coming back to that same Cartesian problem of where we say, oh, we have a bunch of bodies moving around. Um, 
but all space is filled with them. And each one, I mean, that is, they do have a mode that Aristotelians would put in the category of quality, namely shape. Um, um, but you, but you could say in a looser sense, they don't differ qualitatively from one another. Or you could, you could mean that in a stricter way. You could say they're all the same lowest species. Um, but however you look at it, the point is when you go over this line from this one to that one, nothing changes. You're just in a different place. So uh, this line isn't a line, isn't a line that you could draw. There's no basis on which to draw it. And this motion doesn't change anything. So it's not really motion. Again, this should be familiar. This right, this is a problem that that uh, you know Descartes and anyone following Descartes is going to have. What in Spinoza's solution in terms of an infinite series of um, modes defining each mode is like obviously um, even if you want to go in the direction of Mo of Spinoza, which Leibniz doesn't want to, it's obviously kind of uh, weird and questionable, right? So, um, so he's saying, well, no, these composite substances or bodies must be made out of simples that uh, are specifically different from each other. And now we can explain what happens when we go over the line from one to another um, somehow, again, not because they're put together to make it, but somehow or other, uh, certain simple substances compose this one, and other simple substances compose this one, and if at least some of them are different in species, then it, it'll be easy to, to see what changes when you go across the line. But then he says something more surprising, and this is the famous principle of the identity of indiscernibles. It is also necessary that each monad be different from each, from each other. For there are never two things in nature that are perfectly alike, two beings in which it is not possible to discover an internal difference, that is, one founded on an intrinsic denomination. So it um, it turns out that um, each monad has a unique quality. Another way of saying that is that each monad is in its is its own lowest species, which, as Leibniz remarks elsewhere, is what Thomas Aquinas says about angels. Right? Thomas Aquinas says there are genera and species of angels, um, but there are never two angels that belong to the same lowest species. Right? So what Thomas, as an Aristotelian, thinks does happen for, you know, corporeal sublunar substances where you have, you know, animal is divided into species and one of the species is human. But then there's no species under human, right? Just individuals. And all these individuals have the same essence. And they differ only in accidents. But how can they differ in accidents? Remember, this was a point in Spinoza's Ethics where he says substances prior to accidents. That is, um, if these two things aren't already different substances, how do different acts? How can an accident attach to one and not the other? They must have already been different. 
Um, so like, uh, you know, the traditional answer to that in the case of corporeal substances, you know, has to do with their matter being in different places in space. But when you have an angel, which is an incorporeal substance, that answer is not available. And therefore, in the case of angels, um, the hierarchy of species goes all the way down until you get a species for each individual angel. Each one belongs to its own species. And that's what Leibniz's monads are also like. So in a way, it's like, um, well, there's a couple things here. First of all, in a way, it's the exact opposite of what of the way Descartes moves away from Aristotelian doctrine about genus and species, right? De Descartes said all bodies belong to the same lowest species. So the hierarchy is really short, right? There's substance and under substance, as a genus, there's two species, minds and bodies, and that's the end. <laughs> Whereas according to Leibniz, um, there's, on the contrary, there's an infinitely long hierarchy because there's infinitely many monads, as he's gonna explain. So since there's infinitely many monads and each one belongs to its own species, the hierarchy of, of genera and species is infinitely long. <laughs> Um, I never thought of it from this point of view before, but in a way that is the same as Spinoza's solution, in a way, <laughs> right? The, the definition of a monad is infinitely long. You have to give infinitely many differentiate to say which one you're talking about. Say which kind you're talking about, right? That is, uh, I mean, it's also to say which one you're talking about because each one is of its own kind and none of the others are of that kind. Um, but uh, um, um, Right, so that part is the opposite of what Descartes says about species and genus, and it, but it's kind of like Spinoza. This part is exactly like Spinoza, right? Remember that one of the key steps at the beginning of book one of the ethics is to prove that no two substances can share the same attributes. Um, now, I mean, again, in Spinoza, it turns out pretty quickly, there's only one substance and it has all the attributes. <laughs> but um, when, if Leibniz manages to avoid that, he, he still keeps the, the theorem that, um, that each substance must be defined by its attribute. It can't be defined by accidents. In particular, it can't be defined by position in space at a certain time because we have to we have to first know what the substances are before we can talk about their relations to other things or anything like that. So each substance, it, in other words, his proof, like if you want to know what the proof of the principle of identity of indiscernibles is, just look at Spinoza's proof of that proposition near the beginning of book one that no two substances can share an attribute and like subtract the the fact that there's going to be a surprise later and so like um it, it actually is going to turn out that there's lots of different substances but we find that they must all differ from each other essentially they can't differ merely in their modes Am I doing it? Mm, not great, but all right. Let me try to move a little bit faster here. Um, so each 
monad has a quality that makes it the monad that it is. So this is one thing that's unique to that monad, although it has um, um, uh, well, I guess I'm about to talk about how it's one thing, but it has, as I already said, an infinite structure to it, right? It consists of infinitely many differentiae. So like, what is the structure of this quality? Well, it kind of, it has two structures. Um, one is a temporal structure. The, the the quality that makes a monad what it is can be separated out into its state at every time. Right? So like if you wanted to describe what a monad is, um, one way in which you would have to give an infinite num amount of information is you would have to describe how what it's like at every time in its infinite duration. Now, I mean, of course, it, may, it need not actually have an infinite duration because God can create it or annihilate it, but um, it naturally has an infinite duration. That is, according to its own nature, um, it neither begins nor ends anywhere. Um, again, I mean, so that's like what Spinoza showed. It's two things. It's it's like Spinoza showed that every mode continues in its own existence until some external cause acts on it to destroy it. Also, that no mode explains where it came from, but some external mode must explain where it, how it started. Um, but now, say it's not a mode, it's a substance. So um, nothing else has the same attribute as it. I mean, this is like, does Leibniz think the real explanation of why monads are incorruptible and, and ungenerated is just that they don't have parts? Or again, should you just turn to Spinoza's proof about this? <laughs> um, or does, or I think this is the most likely answer. Does Leibniz somehow think these two things are equivalent? <laughs> um, but in any case, so the point is, like, if you have something that is not a is not a a mode in Spinoza's sense, um, it's not limited by other modes of the same nature as it, of the same attribute, then uh, of course, like no other finite thing can explain what, why it has to begin at a certain time or end at a certain time. So unless God intervenes, it, um, unless God has intervened to cause it in the past, if it exists now, it must have always existed. And unless God will intervene in the future to annihilate it, if it exists now, it will always exist. Okay. So like to completely describe what this monad is, you have to describe an infinite number of states that okay. it would naturally take on in the course of time. So this is a little bit weird, right? Like monads are not extended in space, but they are extended in time. Um, uh, I mean, this is a weirdness that, that Leibniz inherits from Descartes and Spinoza. I don't think I ever got a chance to talk about it in Descartes or Spinoza, right? But in Descartes, first of all, like besides the, the list of primary qualities or um, of uh, modes of extension that I kept giving, primary qualities is Locke's terminology, besides the, the list of modes of extension that I kept giving, like size, shape, motion, et cetera. Descartes says, oh, and bodies also have duration. 
but minds also have duration, right? So weirdly, there's a kind of mode that's common to minds and bodies, right? Like they they both they're both temporal. And the same thing seems to happen in Spinoza, right? Like, of course, yeah, from God's point of view, everything is eternal, but there's this other point of view somehow, the point of view of time. And according to the point of view of time, the, both the attributes of uh, the attribute of flaw and the attribute of extension develop in time. And there's some kind of relation of simultaneity between them. Right, because the mind exists when the body exists. So time is like somehow like bridges different attributes. So I think, you know, um, it's not surprising then that in Leibniz we find a little bit strangely that um, even though the monads have been completely dissociated from existence in space, time is still there. And this is something that Kant is going to call attention to. Um, so, uh, yeah, Aiden, did you have a question? Um, I'll admit, I, I got a little bit uh, lost towards the end of what we were talking about there. But like before that, um, like for passing for the introduction of like the uh the passing status states of, is what i wrote there that's supposed to say states states oh oh okay that that makes a lot more sense yeah this um, is sections 10 to 11. i'm supposed to be getting up to section 61 and i've only gotten to 11 so. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah uh this was introduced to like the uh like this is like a part of monads like why like what problems does it solve by introducing this um well um what problems does it solve well i mean um In a way, it solves the same problem that Spinoza is solving. Like, um, if the monad is going to express the infinite divine essence, but it's a finite thing, how can it do that? And the answer is it doesn't express it all at once, right? It expresses it in a, in a development. Um, it's actually, remember, it's the possibility Descartes himself already considered in the third meditation. Maybe, and, and as I said, like according to Spinoza, it's actually true in a way. Maybe I'm something greater than I, than I know, right? That is, maybe all these perfections that, in God, that are actual in God are kind of potential in me, and they're, they're, uh, they're going to come out in my development. Um, so yeah, so that's what the um, so that's the problem it solves, but it also it also creates or continues a problem about what is time, <laughs> right? And why does it have this special status? Why is it okay for the monad to be divisible into temporal parts but not spatial parts? Yeah, Josephine. I was just gonna kind of try to. I guess say what I, it seems to me to be why those those passages are there, which is like he's just gotten through proving that real substance is eternal, right? But like I can look at the world and be like, well, you can say that the substance of my cat is eternal, but it sure doesn't seem like my cat is still alive. So it must be that somehow the that which is eternal can pass through states, otherwise the universe wouldn't look the way it does, right? Uh, well, so, okay. I mean, I think you're mixing up two different things. I mean, so he is going to talk about why it seems like like animals and humans die and are born, right? But at this point, we're talking about something more fundamental, right? Like even when your cat is alive, we say if, if you say there's a particular quality that picks out your cat 
It makes it what it is. And that tells you everything about your past. Then you might say, wait, how could it be changing? <laughs> um, and again, and so I guess you could say that's another problem that it's solving that um, 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 I mean, the reason I put this twiddle here next to accidents and modes, um, they're, they're like accidents or modes in that they're something that's in the monad, not as a part, but, um, but they're unlike accidents or modes, or they're unlike um, some accidents or modes anyway, in that... Um, They're all supposed to be explained by the essence of the monad. Right? Like this monad couldn't exist with some other modes. So that is when you give that infinite definition of the species that the monad belongs to, you'll have finished saying everything that's true about the monad. Everything that's in intrinsically true of the moment. Right? The only other thing you have to add is its relationship to the divine will. Or it doesn't that is, does it exist or not? <laughs> um, is it possible? Is it merely possible or is it actual? But you finish saying everything intrinsic about the monad when you when you specify its quality. And so again, you might think the problem would be, well, if like the monad is characterized by a complete description of it. Like, doesn't that mean there's nothing left to happen to it? So how could it change? So how could my chick cat, like, you know, move? <laughs> Forget how could it die, <laughs> right? And, you know, and, and there again, the answer is that in specifying this quality, what you actually have to give is an inf infinite temporal sequence. I mean, I'm going to partly take that back in what I say next, though. <laughs> so let me go on to that, because the, the each passing state itself has a structure. So the internal structure of a state Um, well, actually, maybe even before that, I should say, uh, I, I should already say, so these, um, so like the way I just said it, like to specify the quality, you have to describe each one of these infinitely many things makes it sound like they're they have no relationship to each other. They could just it could be just any infinite sequence of states. Right? But that's not the way Leibniz thinks about a monad. Rather, this sequence like follows from an internal principle. There goes an actual cat walking, <laughs> proving that it's possible. <laughs> right. So um this this infinite sequence follows from an internal principle. Um, so what that that is um, each one of these states um, like implies the whole future and past course of the monad. So, like, um, how is that possible? How can this one state imply these infinitely many states? Well, because each of these states is infinitely complicated. <laughs> right? So, in a way, this infinite temporal structure is... Um, already contained in the infinite internal structure of each one of these passing states.
And this is, and by the way, this is what Thomas says about the sense in which angels are in time. This, this, is, a, this is a development, right? Development means unfolding. It's a development. Linus actually uh, uh, talks about folds. Right? When, he, when he talks about what a monad says, he says, it can't unfold all its folds at once. <laughs> right? That is, so development means that this whole infinite series is in here, but somehow like folded up. And the, the, the series in the future is going to consist of unfolding it. I mean, that's going to have to explain the sequence if anything does, because remember, nothing acts on the monad externally, right? So, it, like, um, um, if your cat is walking, it can't be, although to all appearances this is not true, right? It can't be because some other things are acting on it externally and giving it um, and pushing it or attracting it or whatever, right? It has to be from the internal nature of the cat. <laughs> I mean, that is of the cat monad. Right, that is the cat's mind. What the cat does has to follow from that, and I, and so that again, that means that the entire infinite sequence of what that mind is going to do is already contained in any one of its individual states. So, and so therefore, there's two ways of looking at this internal structure. One way, which doesn't really get us very far, is that this in internal structure is the, um, the endeavor, right? The kanatus or nisus to get these future states. Right, this this present state, um, the way the future states are folded up in it is that it um, um, tends towards achieving them. It tries, it endeavors to achieve them. Um, and Leibniz says that. Uh, it never succeeds entirely. That's why the that's why the series is infinite, right? It never succeeds entirely, right? In in getting um, what it is endeavoring to get, or being what's endeavoring to be, is probably a better way of putting it. But it always succeeds somewhat. <laughs> So, so that is this. So, this is the monad's appetition. It's something in every monad that's analogous to a will, right? It, so to speak, wants something. But so far, that doesn't tell us anything about what these states are, right? It just tells us that each one wants the future ones. <laughs> so the other part, which is still not that satisfactory, but the other way of looking at the at this internal structure is that it's a structure of perception. Right? And line that says in section 17, um, I'm oh, sorry, that's section. That's section. Oh, no, I've only got a few minutes left. All right. 
Um, I'll, I'll just read what he says here. Furthermore, this is all one can find in the simple substance, that is, perceptions and their changes. It is also in this alone that all the internal actions of simple substances can consist. Right? So the substance, the, the monad, because remember, a monad and a simple substance are the same thing. The monad, what does this quality consist of? It's like, what is the characteristic that defines the monad? Well, it has a perception at every instant, and it has an appetition for further perceptions. I mean, I actually, I don't think you should think of those as, as two, like those are, I think, are supposed to be two different ways of regarding the same state. Um, because the current perceptions contain, already contain the future perceptions folded into them and confused. Um, and the appetition is the, this is the desire to, um, unfold them and make them clear and distinct. Um, okay, so perception of what, however? <laughs> what is the monad, what does every monad have perception of? And the answer is, it perceives all the other monads. All of them. <laughs> right, that's what he says in section 60. Um, because God in regulating the whole has regard for each part and particularly for each monad and since the nature of the monad is representative nothing can limit to represent only a part of things so each monad rem um, represents all other things and remember all things are monads or are made of monads so what that means is that it represents all the other monads So if you ask, like, what do monads look like? How can you picture them? The answer is, um, well, look at your own experience, because you're a monad. <laughs> right? That, I mean, you're a special kind of monad, and I can see I'm not going to get a chance to talk about that tonight because there's um basically we're out of time right now um but um you're a special kind of monad you're a rational monad basically a monad that's able to carry out the argument of descartes meditations <laughs> um uh so you're you're a rational monad um but you but you are a monad you're a simple substance that has a kind of appetition and a kind of perception and so this that you're act that you're perceiving now is all the infinitely many monads. Why does it not look like infinitely many monads? Why does it look like a bunch of bodies and only finitely many bodies? Because it's confused. Right? And this is going to turn out to be what bodies are. What a body is, is the confused way that one monad perceives infinitely many other monads. Okay, but I don't have time to say anything more about it. Um, so I will talk about it more on Monday. And thank you once again for coming. I'll see you then. Thank you, Abe. Have a good day or night. You too. Bye.